Rescuing the bear from the cage was only the first part of the story. Now it seems like they're facing an even scarier thing. At least that's what we get from Ted the Elf. He seems pretty concerned about this Northland that they're headed to. Let's read the rest, some more of the story and see what happens. Chapter 7, Counting the Cost. Ted had listened real hard as the little cub spoke. He'd read hundreds of books late night in his oak. And among all the titles this tree tender read was The Perilous North. Now the tree tender said, Torben comes from Northland, way up where it's cold. At least judging by looks and the tale he just told, we must travel due north where the mountains are high. We should find his cave there. Then he said with a sigh, but we'll be in great peril, for Northland is wild. All the Northmen in Northland are not meek and mild. They smear paint on their faces, a bright shade of blue, and they fight until death, not content with a coup. Northmen like nothing more than to plunder and raid, and my book said they fly with contraptions that they've made. That part's hard to believe, and I doubt that it's true, but I deem the rest plausible, credible too. We will have to be sure to steer clear of that lot. We will wish we were dead if we get ourselves caught. And my book said there's more than mere Northmen to fear. There are creatures up there that we do not see down here. There are things up in Northland we thought were extinct. The elf's face had grown grave and he nervously blinked. All the animals there are much larger, I've read. And they're said to be fiercer, he solemnly said. Now Sir Ray had enough. And he said, I don't mind. We're a pretty tough bunch, those big Northmen will find. And of horrible creatures, I don't care a fig. No matter how ugly, ferocious or big. Yes, you're right, Ted agreed, as he shouldered his pack. Let's go north to the Northland. Let's take Torben back. But the boy became silent. The kid hated heights. The mere mention of mountains gave Martin the frights. For a scary thing happened to Martin and Ray on a tall mountain cliff, and it's hard to convey the effect that the incident had on the prince. But believe me, the boy hated heights ever since. Just imagining Northland gave Martin distress. Oh, I must find a way to get out of this mess. I cannot go up high, the prince privately thought. In the pit of his stomach, there grew a tight knot. And at least five excuses occurred to the lad. But he knew if he stayed, he would always feel bad. The kid looked at his comrades, who needed his aid. What would they think if the, of the prince if he stayed? Martin took a deep breath, and he made up his mind. He would stick with his friends. He would not stay behind. Now the prince swallowed hard, wiped cold sweat from his brow. Martin said, time to go. Cousin Meg, show us how. Meg was already pulling her map from her pack. The girl plotted a course that would put them on track. As she studied her map, Princess Meg kept in mind all that Torben had told them, although he was blind. I think Torben lives here. What do you fellows say? They all nodded their heads. I agree, added Sir Ray. That's a hundred miles north, the wolf solemnly said. But he wasn't concerned for himself, Ray, or Ted. John was worried about the two kids and the bear. Could they travel that far to that cold northern lair? Then a voice said, You're right. That's a long way to walk. They all jumped when they heard it. The voice was a shock. The voice came from the shadows beneath a tall tree. They were straining their eyes thinking, Who can that be? Someone stepped from the shadows and into the light, the first golden rays as the dawn pierced the night. They now saw that a man had been under the oak, but his face was obscure, obscured 
by the hood of his cloak. The man pulled back the hood and the sun lit his face. In amazement, John whispered, Good morning, your grace. For the man was the king, and he said with a smile, I was sure you'd show up. I have waited a while. The king gave a low whistle. A whinny replied. Soon two ponies appeared, and they stood at his side. Now they nuzzled the king. He brought one for each kid. Well, don't look so surprised. Do you think I'd forbid you from doing a deed like the one that you've got planned? Since my grandfather's time, selling slaves has been banned. Freeing Torben was just and courageous and fair. You must finish your quest. Take him north to his lair. He unslung something round that he wore on his back. It was shaped like a disc. It was silver and black. The boy's eyes opened wide. The king tossed it his way. Martin caught it midair in the new light of day. The boy studied the object, the shield Now he now held, and the young fellow's chest a great happiness welled. It's for you, said the king, and he smiled at his son. I claimed it up, nor I claimed it up north in a battle we won. I defeated my foe, brought it back as a prize. But I also got this. Above one of his eyes was a jagged white scar. I was barely 16. Those big Northmen are tough, the most surly I've seen. You, mo you most likely won't see them at this time of year. They hole up in their fortresses, drinking their beer. Oh, but watch for their hunters out searching for prey. You'll want to avoid them and hide right away. The king pulled back his cloak and they saw underneath that he wore a small dagger encased in a sheath. This blade once was a Northman's, but not any more. I returned with this knife at the end of the war. The king gave it to Meg, and the girl fairly beamed. She unsheathed this small dagger. It glimmered and gleamed. Now the girl stowed her knife. She did not want to lose it. It was safe in her pack if she needed to use it. The king smiled at our friends, looked them each in the eye, and he gave them his blessing and bid them goodbye. He returned to the castle. Our friends stood in awe. They just couldn't believe that not one of them saw that the king was nearby when they stopped for that rest. Ah, but Torben had noticed. At least he had guessed that a man had been close. He perceived things so well. The cub sensed he was kind, though, so he didn't tell. The companions departed, their journey commenced. And though they were cheerful, they all clearly sensed that this quest would be challenging and dangerous, too. But by sticking together, they might make it through. Chapter 8. North to Northland They went north for a day and departed the west. They moved quickly and seldom slowed down to rest. For the prince rode one pony and Meg and the bear were both riding the other, a spirited mare. When they passed through the last of the civilized realms, our friends entered a forest of beeches and elms. They walked out of that wood and then into a field. It was verdant and green and completely concealed. The field ended abruptly, abutting a wall is made of stone and was 10 feet too tall for the ponies to jump, so they left them to graze. They'd be safe in that field as the difficult phase of the journey began for our friends and the bear. On the wall was a sign and the sign said, beware. Using ropes, the companions climbed over the wall. The poor prince was sure, nervous, afraid he would fall. But they all made it safely and wondered a lot why the wall had been built. It was a troubling thought. Now they looked on that land, that strange northern frontier. It seemed rugged and cold. They knew the Northland was near. They had hiked half a day when they spotted a herd of the largest creatures, quite heavily furred. They had trunks and white tusks 
how they made the ground quake. Our friends hid among the trees and saw pine needles shake. As these beasts passed them by, the companions just stared. And they were glad the great brutes neither noticed nor cared. Our friends kept walking north. As the farther they ranged, they were struck by how much of all the scenery had changed. In the shade of the trees hid the scraps of past snows. Many miles to the north, mighty mountains arose. There among them, a fortress stood stark and severe. Twas the first sign of man in that northern frontier. It looked down from above on the mountains and hills. It looked cruel and cold. The thing gave them the chills. Meg consulted her map. We're in Northland, all right. They all silently stared at the ominous sight. That is, all but the bear, whose ear now pressed to the ground. Little Torben detected a troubling sound. He said, Riders approach. These vibrations don't lie. We must hide right away or we're all going to die. Now they all turned to Torben and saw fear on his face. They looked back to the north and just saw empty space. But they all hid behind boulders, their eyes fixed ahead. And then five minutes later, like Torben had said, several hunters approached. There were six, maybe more. They all bristled with weapons looking ready for war. They wore capes made of fur. They had greasy goatees. They were scarred and tattooed. Princess Meg noticed fleas. They had painted their faces a bright shade of blue. It was clear to the friends this was one deadly crew. And the worst part by far of this whole episode was the frightening mounts these barbarians rode. The two kids held their breath as the, as the hunters rode by. The prince sighed when they passed, having not caught their eye. Martin said, that was close. We'd better press on. They had almost stepped out when they all noticed John. The wolf's hackles were up. He looked rigid and scared. Our friends followed John's eyes. They looked up and they stared. High above in the clouds, there were men in the sky. They were gliding above. Could the Northlanders fly? The wolf whispered, don't move. Become one with these rocks. Those are scouts up above and they're watching like hawks. So they all held really still as the scouts floated past. Ted's eyes followed their flight and he muttered, at last. Now I know why my book said contraptions that fly. Oh, but who would have thought they could hover so high? The boy shuddered a bit as those gliders at those gliders that he'd seen. He felt queasy and sick, and his face appeared green. So the kids have discovered, the team, I guess, has discovered a little bit more about what they'll be facing over the next part of their journey. A very difficult journey ahead of them, a very scary journey, a very dangerous journey. They're also visited by a special guest. The king came. And he gave them special tools, tools to help them in this journey. The king didn't keep the kids from going or any of the team from going. He felt what they were doing was good and right and important. Instead, he equipped them for the work that was before them. You know, that reminds me of Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 and 23, where God, who has called us to live a certain way, He's called us to be his children and to be his ambassadors and to represent him. And he too has given us special gifts. In particular, he's given us the Holy Spirit who equips us for the difficult things that are before us and the challenging things that we need to do. Maybe get your parents or to, to read to you or pull out a Bible yourself and find Galatians chapter 5 and give it a read. And think about the things that God has given to you to help you be strong and brave.